Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to another edition of Inside Arsenal. It is Thursday and yes, I know this is a little bit later than usual uh, this recording, but I've been busy out and about this morning in London, in Covent Garden, uh, doing some book signing. Uh, and that was unavoidable. She's watching this on the screen. You can see it right there. 200 of them I had to sit there and sign for the brilliant Goldsboro Books in Covent Garden. They did have a limited amount of signed copies on sale, which I told you about a while ago. They sold out so, so quickly, amazingly quickly. So I've been back in today, signed more, and they are on sale now while stocks last. And trust me, last time they didn't last very long at all. So if you do want to get a signed copy of the book and you haven't got one yet, then go over to the Goldsboro Books website. I'll put the link in the description below and you can get one of the ones that I signed and dated today. But judging by how quickly they sold out last time, they're not going to be around for long. So I would advise you do it sooner rather than later. So that's why I was a little bit later today. And while I'm on the subject of the book, before I get in today's episode, I have to say a big thank you to all. Because if you're watching this on the screen right now, you can see right there in text, Sunday Times bestseller. I found out yesterday evening that the book in week one has made it into the Sunday Times bestseller list and is officially a Sunday Times bestseller in the hardback nonfiction category. And I can't thank you all enough for the support you have given me and for all of you going out and ordering the book. It really does mean a lot. The last week has been pretty overwhelming and uh, I really do appreciate it. It's mad to think it was a week ago. Today was the launch night at the Tollington and it's just been a bit of a whirlwind seven days since then so thank you very much for the support I can't honestly believe that it is a Sunday Times bestseller and uh, I really do appreciate that support okay let's get into some Arsenal stuff now shall we because let's say you don't want to hear me rattle on about the book you've heard me rattle on about that far too much over the last month or so um, and I'll start with news of an imminent transfer for Marcelo Flores and Arsenal very talented, one of Arsenal's very talented young players, attackers, 19 years old. Um, and he's on his way out. He's going to Mexico. He's a Mexico international, of course. I, th I think he's a Mexico international because I know when he, he got his first senior cap, that was in a game that wasn't down as an official match. So he didn't get that official first cap, if you see what I mean. But I think he might have been called up and made a substitute appearance in one that does make him a, a fully fledged uh, Mexico international. But he's, of course, a Mexico under-21s international as well. Really talented young player. He's been at Arsenal for a while, spent last season on loan over in Spain with Levante. But from my understanding, he is now very, very close to a move to Mexico, to Tigres. I think that's how you pronounce it. It will be a permanent move. Uh, he signed a new contract, or actually he didn't sign a new contract. Arsenal took up an option on his contract um, during the second half of last season while he was out on loan, and that extended it by a further two years, very similar to what they did with Charlie Patino while he was at Blackpool. Um, and uh, so Arsenal, you know, protected themselves financially from that. They're not going to get massive amounts from uh, for Flores. I'm not sure on the exact figure. I haven't been told it by asking um, and trying to dig around. I think it might be around the sort of two million mark, but I don't know that for sure. Um, so I can't really report it as actual complete fact that that's what it is. But um, what Arsenal do with these deals as well, which I imagine they've done this time, is there'll be some sort of sell-on clause including this deal, as there is uh, for a lot of the, for a lot of the players that they move on, or they have a sort of matching rights clause where if someone comes in and bids for them, Arsenal then have first refusal to sign them back. They did that with Dan Ballard, for example, when they sold him to Sunderland, um, and I imagine they would have certainly looked to protect themselves with Marcelo Flores and. In a, in a way, it's a shame. I've got a question or a comment here that I thought I'd bring in uh, from Fatali. He says, hi, Charles. I'm a regular viewer of your content. Just a couple of questions. Firstly, do you not think we can improve our scouting, i.e. finding some gems before teams like Bryson do, given the inflated nature of the transfer market? Surely we need to improve our scouting. Secondly, apart from from Ethan Ranieri, no academy players have been given their debut by Arteta. Is that academy pipeline being dry or is Arteta's ability to trust young talents? And I thought this was kind of... This tied in really to Marcelo Flores. I thought I'd link the two together rather than leaving to answer that question right at the end because it is an interesting one. It's one the fingers often pointed at Mikel for failing to really give academy graduates their opportunity, which in a way it's quite, there's one very easy argument where you say, well, look how much game time he's given to Martinelli, Saka, Smith Rowe, those sort of players in Ketia. Yes, he didn't give them their debuts, but they were still very young and untested really, apart from, you know, 
even Saka when Mikel came in. And yet he's played them into the team to be absolute, complete, and utter regulars. Um, so it's not that he doesn't give youngsters the chance. But I also think when you look at where Arsenal are now than where they were when Mikel took over, it's far harder to give academy products an opportunity, a real opportunity to start. And when you look at that, it's because of the demands, it's because of the expectations. Arsenal now are expected to be in a title race. They're expected to be competing for big honours because that's the tra trajectory they've been on under Mikel when you know they were right in their sort of darkest depths really towards the end of Unai when Mikel took over, when Mikel had that awful run at the start in his first full season. They were kind of at rock bottom and it's very easy then to give young young players an opportunity. So that's when, you know, Saka suddenly got his chance. Smith Rowe came into the team, got his chance. Martinelli got his chance. And it's easier to do that, I think, when expectations are really low and when you're almost at rock bottom, which Arsenal were. Now, when you're right at the top, when you're competing with Manchester City, it's like it's very easy to say, oh, give Amari Hutchinson a chance, give... Marcelo Flores a chance, give Charlie Patino a chance. You know, and we all want to see that because we love to see academy players come through. But from Mikel's point of view, he is judged on winning and he is judged on getting as close to Manchester City as he possibly can. So is he going to really turn to a young player and give them time to grow into the team? It's a, it's a really hard balancing act. And it's one that we spoke, a few of us journalists, we sat down with um, Per Mertesacker and Jack Wiltshire last season on the way to the, uh, UA, uh, the FA Youth Cup final. And we talked to them about that and they were fully in agreement. They were, they were like, look, it's going to be miles harder for us now. We know that as a club, we know it's going to be harder for academy players to get through because they've ris the, the quality of the first team squad has risen to such an extent that you have to be very, very, very special to get in now. And that's the demands that are going to be put on the academy. And that's what they're going to have to work to because they want these players to come through. Arsenal want these players to come through, but they have to be at the very top level. And, you know, Marcelo, clearly a very talented player got huge amounts of potential really skillful and all that but you know it's not like he went to Sp Spain and tore it up last season and so is he ready to come into the Arsenal first team you have to say no Amari Hutchinson went off where is he he's on loan at Ipswich at the moment for, from Chelsea you know even Charlie who's you know such a talented young kid and you can see it with his performances at Blackpool and what he's doing with Swansea right now is he ready can you blood him and into the Arsenal first team now if you want Arsenal to be competing for the title I'm not sure you can so it's a really hard balance in acting. It's one that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the next next few years. But I don't I don't necessarily think it's something to about Arteta not trusting the young talents. I just think given where Arsenal are now and what they're playing for and what they have to do every single game to try and keep up with Manchester City if they want to stay in the title race, I think it's just really, really hard. And in terms of the first point of the question there, do you think you can improve our scouting? Everyone can improve their scouting always. Obviously, you know, Arsenal have had some success, they've had some failures. Most teams have there's some outliers there when you look at Brentford and Brighton, but their whole sort of business model is built around that. Arsenal's isn't. Arsenal's right now, their business model is built around winning and that's where a lot of the focus goes. And that's always a sort of um, food chain almost. I don't know if that's the right way to explain it, but there is in football, there's a food chain, isn't it? You want to identify the young talents, but if you're the top clubs, even if you don't, you always sort of go down and then grab them off someone else. And we've seen that happen with Brighton with everyone you know Chelsea have done it Arsenal have done it and with Brentford as well so I think there's always that kind of natural food food chain when it comes in but of course you know everyone has to improve their scouting um, and there's just so much competition in it right now okay on to the Ballon d'Or um, I'm not sure you saw it but I'm sure you probably did yesterday Martin Odegaard, Bukai Saka, Amanda Ilstead, Katie McCabe and Aaron Ramsdale were all nominated at the Ballon d'Or ceremony Martin and Bukai obviously for the men's award, Amanda and Katie for the women's award and Aaron Ramsdale for the Yashin award for the best goalkeeper. He was one of 10 goalkeepers nominated for that. So fantastic success for Arsenal. Obviously such a huge prestigious award ceremony that is coming up. Um, I don't think anyone's going to win, obviously, out of the Arsenal crew. I think it's all pretty well known who's going to win the men's one. I'd be stunned if it's not Lionel Messi. And if it's not Lionel Messi, it's going to be Erling Haaland. Um, not sure on the women's one. It's probably a, a, a little bit closer in terms of who's going to win that. And then I can't imagine Aaron Ramsdale's going to win the goalkeeper's one, but it doesn't matter. You know, it still shows where Arsenal are now. It shows the improvement across all the clubs, um, how it's being operated, men's, women's, youth team last year getting to the Youth Cup final. It's just a sort of recognition again for the excellent success that all of those are having. So congratulations to them. And, you know, really great night for the for the women yesterday as they started off their Champions League campaign uh, with a 3-0 win over in um, Sweden. It was setting up a game, I think it's Paris FC they've got now in, on Saturday at the weekend as they look to qualify for the Champions League. It's a really good sort of start for 
uh, for the ladies. Alicia Russo making a debut in that game. Didn't go entirely to plan. Missed a good chance before being substituted, but she's going to play her way in. Obviously, got to give her time after such a big money move. or well, not money move, but um, a big high-profile move. And um, she's obviously been very, very busy in the last couple of months as well with England over in Australia. So she's going to have to be given time. But Arsenal getting the job done. So fantastic for them. Really good start to the season. Congratulations. Hopefully Saturday goes well as well. OK, on to some of your questions and comments now. There's one here from Cheng Staff. He says, Ramsdale deserves to keep his spot for now. His communication with the back line is key and probably overlooked. Everyone is quick to forget how many points Ramsdale, Ramsdale saved us last season. Well, I should play in the cup competitions for now and we'll see how he performs. This was obviously in response to what I was talking about in yesterday's show about the Raya Ramsdale situation. Our reports that Arteta is getting increasingly tempted to turn to David Raya once the international break is over. The cup competitions are about to start. Arsenal playing at Brentford. All the narrative there of David Raya potentially making his debut against Brentford, who are his parent club in the Carabao Cup. And I tend to agree. I don't think Ramsdale deserves to lose his spot at the moment. I just don't think he's done much wrong at all, really. I know there's a lot to do in the rounds in terms of what his XG is, in terms of the goalkeeping XG. You know, he should have. I think he's conceded 1.8 goals more than should be expected this season. That's the, that's the number doing the round and the stats doing the round. But when I look at that, I don't really buy it. To be honest, I, you know, I'm not the biggest XG fan as it is, but. I kind of look at the goals that Arsenal conceded on the opening goal or get game against one foot um, Forest story on the breakaway. I don't put that down to Aaron Ramsdale. I don't see, see how he could have really saved that. It was a clean sheet, obviously, at Palace the next game. Then it was a 2-2 with Fulham. I know the first goal doesn't look great for Ramsdale, but I'm still utterly convinced that the only reason that happened was because the guy was trying to chip Ramsdale and he was obviously anticipating the chip. You could see the guy was setting up to do the chip and... And uh, the guy miskicked it completely. And because of that, Ramsdale was wrong-footed and he just couldn't get back in time. So I don't look at that as a massive error from Ramsdale, despite it not looking the best, obviously, from the corner for the header for Paulinho's equaliser. I don't see he could have really saved that. And the United one, again, you know, lots of people to blame for that goal, I think. And I don't have Aaron Ramsdale anywhere near the front of that list. It was just by the time Rashford had got into the position to shoot where he shot from, you know, the damage had been done. And it would have been a remarkable save if Ramsdale had kept that out. So I don't think he's done anything wrong yet. And I agree absolutely with you, Chanks. I think Ryan should play in the cup competitions and we'll see how the pair of them get on. There's going to be lots of games coming, even if you know if it means a rise in the Champions League as well as the Carabao Cup. You're going to be able to almost compare the two week in, week out as the rotation goes on. I think that's the position where maybe we might see a change in goalkeeper. But right now, I think it'd be really harsh if Arsenal came back after the international break at Everton. Ramsdale had lost his place in the team. Uh, here's one from Vet Para. It says, hi, Charles. Uh, I think all of us want to see the party Rice Odegaard midfield, but no one really speaks about Jorginho Rice and Odegaard in party's absence, which also really excites me. Apart from the lack of legs, which is arguably Rice's best attribute, absolutely, Jorginho is a fabulous player. His performance in Newcastle last year was one of my most mem memorable individual performances of 2022-23. Finally, really think Jorginho will get decent minutes in Champions League given his experience and quality in possession. Yep, look, 100% agree with everything you said there. I think Jorginho, it often gets overlooked just how good a signing Jorginho has been for Arsenal. I think he's been brilliant on the pitch when he's played, off the pitch when he hasn't played, but the, what he's done and delivered in the changing room and at the training ground, such a hugely influential player in the squad despite only arriving in January. Clearly has got a lot to offer as well. I Like you, that performance at Newcastle was, you know, it was absolutely spectacular. He was so good in that game. And that was a game when I looked at it and thought, oh, I think Jorginho is going to struggle because we know the intensity that Newcastle play with. The atmosphere was incredible. It was honestly, I think, Arsenal's best win of the season last year, that win at St. James's Park. And yet all of my worries about Jorginho playing were totally unfounded. He reveled in that intensity and that pace of that game. So it wasn't even like he was. He looked like his legs had gone or anything like that, which obviously a lot of people say when it comes to him. So yeah, look, if Partey's injured and you want to go with that midfield, especially when you look at the games coming up, potentially against Manchester City, um, just before the second international break, games like that, you know, it's an option. And I think it'd be a really good option. And I think like you, Jorginho has got a big impact to make on this season, especially in the Champions League, because I think he's absolutely primed and perfect for that competition. OK, now on to one here from Reggie Perry says, for the Havertz penalty, here's my fundamental issue with that whole exchange. He's talking about the VAR exchange that we heard the audio from in that show with Michael Owen and... Um, Howard Webb says the rule is clear and obvious error. 
Did the ref make a clear and obvious error? In this exchange, they're trying to make the right call. If they're going to use that as a standard, then they need to apply it everywhere. That's exactly what I said yesterday, and I agree completely. I think I have no problem with that not being a penalty. I think they have come to the right decision because I don't think it was a penalty. There was contact, but I don't think it was enough. And I think Havertz was trying to buy the penalty. I said it, I was at the other end of the stadium and I said it at the time, in real time. It just didn't look like a penalty to me. It looked like Havertz had gone down really, really easily and nothing I've seen in the replay suggests otherwise for that. But having said that, I still think I was, I was still really surprised it was overturned because I don't think it was a clear and obvious error and I don't think what we saw in the replays, given the contact that we saw, there was a clear and obvious error there. So for the referee to be overturned, it felt like they were re-refereeing the game. And when you hear that audio and you hear... Anthony Taylor going over and asking before he gets there, what am I going to see? It's just like, do you need to ask that? Should you be told that? Surely you just go there and make your own mind up rather than VAR basically telling you what you've done wrong and what you're going to see and what their opinion of it is. Surely the referee's opinion is the key thing here. Um, and so I just want to see this like you. I want to see consistency across this now. So if that's fine, if that's not a penalty at the weekend, that's fine. But in all the other instances, and we're going to see countless of them between now and the end of the season, I want to see that same rule applied because otherwise it's just that inconsistency thing again that is going to continue to plague VAR and um, and it's going to sort of lead to the accusations of agendas and conspiracies and all that sort of stuff. Not that I buy really buy into any of that. I don't think there are uh, agendas and conspiracies and all that. But, um, you know, it's incidents like this and if it continues to go against what sort of one team and then other teams get favourable decisions with a very similar scenario, then it's just very difficult to sort of brush off those accusations. So I just want to see a consistent rule given and stuck to throughout the season when it comes to those type of VAR decisions. All right, that's it for today's show, everyone. Thank you very much for watching as always. And like I said, thank you once again for the incredible support you've all given me with the book in the first seven days that it's been out for sale. I can't believe it's officially a Sunday Times bestseller and I'm a Sunday Times bestselling author. Just saying that sounds unbelievable. And uh, it's a proper pinchy moment. So thank you very much to you all and have a fantastic rest of the day wherever you're watching this. If you are here in the UK and you're like me, absolutely sweltering right now, <laughs> right now in this heat wave, it's a bit of a killer. But uh, yeah, hopefully it won't last too long. And if you are going to go out in the sunshine, enjoy it, have a beer, and I will catch up with you all very, very soon. Have a good day, everyone.